The documentary is titled American Made Movie, and we want to introduce the two directors and producers behind the film, Vincent Vittoria and Nathan Thomas McGill. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being with us. And let's begin with the trailer to give you a sense of what this film is all about. U.S. Steel Corporation today announced that it's permanently closing Jones 16 Steel plant. Steel plant is shutting down. Devastating news against American steel mills shutting down all when you, as an economy, get rid of your manufacturing base, the results are very cataclysmic. You have a domino effect. You know, I always said our motto was, you dream it, we build it. Suddenly, I seen the sales dropping off. Mark called me up, he said, Dad, we lost a job. He said somebody else bit us. It's not within the United States, it's somebody overseas. Since the year 2000, we've lost about 5.5 million. Somebody overseas. Since the year 2000, we've lost about 5.5 million manufacturing jobs. That loss in manufacturing jobs is kind of the backbone that has caused this incredible unemployment. What do I do now? I'm almost 50 years old. All I know is this. What the country's realizing now is that making things is important. One of the things that's always been great about America is Americans. It gets back to it just being good business to invest in your community. We understand why businesses offshore their production. We also fundamentally believe that making things is critically important to the long-term health of this country. Back in my hometown. We're making more sales. We're making more partnerships. on a lot of people that's something to be proud of. It's about believing in something. What if you fail? That's not an option. The title is American Made Movie. Nathan McGill, what's the message? We think that this movie has the power to change the country because it's not about looking at the, at the left and looking at the right. This movie is about all of our responsibility and this relationship that we all have to manufacturing, whether we realize it or not. So we, we believe that there is this relationship with the products that we buy and the things that are made in the country. Vincent Vittorio, why this film, why this topic, and why you? Well, our company, Life is My Movie Entertainment, focuses on nonfiction cinema that has you know, relevance with topics that we feel like need to be brought to the attention of the, the general public. And so this is something that Nathan and I both have a relationship to manufacturing through our family history. And we realize that you know, as things have uh, really gone on the decline, that there's still a bright day ahead. And we felt by bringing this documentary, we're able to kind of get deeper into that topic to let the, the general public understand kind of a better un understanding of what's happened to manufacturing and why it's gotten the way it has. We're also at this intersection of the start of the football season and the playoffs for baseball. And there's a connection with all of that this morning in the Washington Post. In Ada, Ohio, a town that manufactures uh, the pigskin, the footballs, about 700 footballs a year, averaging about 4,000 a day in this northwest, Pennsylvania, northwest Ohio town with 120 full-time workers at the Wilson Manufacturing Company. And you begin the documentary with a focus on baseball. Let's watch. There's also a deep sense of nostalgia that comes along with the day at the ballpark. There's a unique, patriotic spirit underlying the game that brings everyone together, not unlike a backyard family barbecue or fireworks on the 4th of July. But I wonder, how often do we really think about all the different elements that go into making a baseball game? Just how American is America's pastime these days? The truth is, in an increasingly global economy, it takes manufacturers from all over the world to make the things necessary to have a baseball game. While as consumers, we often consider the price of admission, are the overpriced hot dogs in terms of our own enjoyment. Have you ever really thought about the people involved in the game beyond the coaches and players? What about the folks who make the bats, the gloves, the baseballs, or even the souvenirs in the gift shop? Your purchase of that ticket affects their livelihoods. The pattern holds true in all the purchases we make in our everyday lives. And as the marketplace becomes saturated with companies trying to gain a leg up on one another, the manner in which your money is spent becomes even more crucial to determining how and where those goods are created. 
from the movie, American-made movie. And Vincent Vittoria, we also have a radio audience, so explain some of the numbers on the screen. Well, you know, what we do is we take a lot of the um, elements of what's used in baseball and we'll uh, kind of strip those out and kind of talk about the different elements of what actually is made here and what's not and just show kind of either the country of origin as well as, um, you know, where some of the, um, I guess, the, the pieces of the, the hole, whether it's a, a baseball, um, you know, that there might be um, items from multiple countries, but it might be assembled in a different country. So we kind of break it down and look at these different pieces of what we use to play the game of baseball. When you put this film together, what, what struck out? What did you learn? Um, I think we were both surprised at, at how much manufacturing is really going on in the country. When we first started off making the movie, we didn't know if we were going to end up being depressed after two years because of all of the decline that is surely there. And so we went from community to community and really took a look at what's going on in manufacturing today. And absolutely, there are, there are really heartbreaking stories across the country about the decline of manufacturing. Um, but the film really focuses, focuses on a tale of entrepreneurship. What is it like for manufacturers today to compete in this global economy? And so we focus on the film on a small company, a medium-sized company, a larger company to really tell the tale or tell the tale of American manufacturing today. Our phone lines are open. 202 is the area code here in Washington, D.C., 585-3880. Our line for Democrats and 202-585-3881 for Republicans. And you can also join us on our Facebook page. Send us an email at journal at cspan.org or send us a tweet at cspanwj. Where are some of the bright spots economically, manufacturing-wise? Well, I, I, it's hard to, to say a specific example of the country, but, but seeing some of the companies we've focused on because, you know, a lot we left off. I don't want to say the companies we followed are the only people doing things, but New Balance, for instance, they're the at last athletic shoe manufacturer in America. And they're producing shoes in the New England area in several factories. And when you go to where those factories are, you see the spillover effect because you see that there are coffee shops and, you know, breakfast places and things that are there, um, bowling alleys and things because of that, you know, business being there. It's the largest employer of a, a smaller town in Maine, uh, Scohegan, Maine. And, you know, it's seeing the effect of those jobs, what it goes to within that community and, you know, who it employs and what it does. It, it, if you can take that example and apply it to anywhere in America and just imagine when that's stripped away, what's lost. I mean, the same thing with Detroit. We spend a lot of time in Detroit and to see the size of these large factories and to think that these all employed people that had children that went to school, that had, you know, relatives that were in similar fields of this, they're all gone. And I think that's the depressing part. But at the same time, when we go to a city like Skohegan and see that it's alive and well, that you know that the effect it has on a community is, you know, everlasting and it expands beyond just that company itself. And of course, with regard to Detroit, one of the political questions facing the next mayor of that city. Yeah. And, and what are you going to do in terms of... Uh, of that, that city, I mean, historically is known for manufacturing. It's known for the industrialization. And really, in the film, we focus on using Detroit as the poster child for the decline in manufacturing. And there's no question that if you look at it today, um, what manufacturing has become uh, is uh, a, a different type of story. So you had all the processes made in one particular area, and they focus completely on that, and as manufacturing declined, uh, and the way that we manufacturing, the way manufacturing has changed, uh, certainly has affected um, that area over the last you know 50 years. It's incredible. We'll get to your calls and comments in just a moment. But let's go back to New Balance and this town in Maine impacted by New Balance presence. More from the American Made Movie documentary. Knowing that we put shoes on a lot of people's feet, you know, it, it really is. It's something to be proud of, you know. It's all about pride. You, you pass on good work because you want that next person to, to be able to do what they need to do. And yeah, it's all about pride. By having New Balance in town, we're able to filter more of the economy all through the area. They're, they're a family. They're part of our family in Skowhegan, and we don't know what we would do without them. New Balance in Skowhegan provides a purpose. I heard one of our economic developers refer to it as a, uh, 
a thread in the tapestry, and New Balance being one of the largest threads, one of the clearest threads. And I thought he put it really well. We are, uh, and we're proud to be that. It's, again, part of the philosophy of the New Balance business model, is that we are in the communities. We're a business the community is proud to host. If we can all agree that manufacturing is a good thing for the country as a whole, but we don't want to give up the low prices we've come to expect, then where do we go from here? If we want to see an increase in U.S. manufacturing, who can we trust to make it happen? Who can we trust? Oh gosh, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to say it's, it's your own community because we look at things on a national level, right? And we say, oh, well, politicians aren't doing this or Congress is pulling us one way. We're a Democrat, Republican, Independent. But ultimately, if we forget all the policies and look specifically at our community, that's the direct effect that we can have. And that's where it starts to consumers. Um, you know, if, if everyone's a consumer that's watching this right now, you know, whether you realize it or not, we all play a part with spending our money. So if we look at our community first, our state next, and then our nation, we can make a change with things because supply and demand will show that the money that we spend in our economy or within this country is something that can truly increase manufacturing, but not taking it to the extreme to where everything has to be from there. Take, for instance, I live in California, an avocado. If I go to the grocery store and I buy an avocado, I'm sure there might be one from Costa Rica, Guatemala, I mean, you, you name it but they grow them in California. So for me not to look at the state of California first is kind of a disjustice to my own community. And I think that if people can get that in their heads to think, okay, you know, I, I, can, I can do something by spending money specifically where I live first, you know, not take it to the extreme, it, it'll, it'll really help supply and demand and help our country in this economy. Nathan McGill, one of our viewers, trying to put this in perspective post-World War II, saying that, quote, at the end of World War II, much of the rest of the industrialized world lay in ruins. It was a given that it would rebuild eventually. And, of course, that could be one of the contributing factors to the decline of American manufacturing in this global economy. Absolutely. After World War II, we were 50 percent of the world's economy. And if you think about that just for a minute, uh, I mean, that that's a... Uh, a great step forward. You got like the head start in the race and we built America's middle class uh, with manufacturing and we just kind of spurred along like nothing was going to ever change. And as these other countries came into uh, starting to compete with us, as we started to globalize and, and go to other countries to do manufacturing, our own sector started to decline. So that's the story of manufacturing. Um, why didn't anyone think to make a plan? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> Well, let's put this into, into some perspective from the Manufacturing Institute, a look at uh, manufacturing by the numbers. Nearly 12 million Americans are currently employed directly by manufacturers. The average salary in the U.S. from 2011, just over $77,000 a year, responsible for about half of total U.S. exports. But Richard from Arkansas says, it's really irritating to me that young folks in the U.S. look to getting the slimmest and cheapest education. They think that they will survive on the simple education, which is exactly what our problem is as we move into the future. Yeah, I think that education is something that we all have to look at. What is the true purpose of education? And as we've gone through city after city, showing the film, sharing the film, uh, it's really been about workforce development. How do we get students interested in these high-paying jobs? Because they're really great jobs. We've been on the factory floor where a plant manager has looked over at a machine and said, you see these machines right here? They would be running right now if I had two warm bodies that were properly trained. So we have this skills gap in the country right now where we actually have jobs that we can provide, um, but we need the, the folks with the right type of training. A four-year university degree is great for a lot of people, but it's not going to get it done for the economy as a whole. Let's go to Angus joining us from Edgewater, Florida, our line for Democrats. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I was wondering if you had given any consideration uh, in your filming to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership that's currently being negotiated. Well, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we kind of pulled out anything that was uh, politics or newsworthy because we were afraid that um, it would kind of kill the, um, the, the, the date of the film because if it's evergreen and it's something that applies to those princi principles of the importance of manufacturing within a certain community and kind of the spillover effect or the role that the consumer plays, we're allowed to kind of keep this alive and keep the argument to, you know, why manufacturing is important to our country. So while that's a very important topic, 
I think it's um, you know still kind of evolving and things are going on as we um, you know as we made the film and then of course years to come. Vincent Vittorio and Nathan McGill, both the director and producer of the American Made movie. Nathan McGill, let me begin with you. What's your background? My family actually came from a manufacturing family. And so I grew up with my grandpa working at uh, a, a local General Motors plant, my, my dad, my uncles. And, uh, and I went sort of a different direction with going into to film and, and trying to look at documentary. Um, but really there wasn't another choice. The plants are closed and, and there isn't manufacturing in, in that area. So to come back and, and to do a film on this topic has been um, a very personal thing for both of us because we both have family in manufacturing. Well, so. one of our viewers says this, Detroit is broke. President Obama saved the car companies. Too bad that the car jobs went overseas. 70% of GM cars are made overseas. It's, it's, it's crazy because the idea is what is made in America today? And we have to look at it from the lens of a global economy. And so in Georgia, where I am from, if you want to buy a car that's made in Georgia, now you're looking at a Kia. Well, that's a Korean car manufacturer, but they're providing a lot of jobs in West Point, Georgia. So it, it's changed. It's not as clear as it used to be. A lot of the brands that you think are American aren't American. And um, it, it, it's interesting to see uh, where it's gone. You have to actually roll up the sleeves. You have to do a little research. But d we do believe that demand can get this done. If we demand more American-made goods, then we'll see uh, more jobs and we'll see politicians figuring out the best ways to keep manufacturing here. And Vincent Vittorio, Joanne says, to buy American, salaries need to increase. I think that's... It, it's. A true argument with certain products, but I don't think across the board it's a, it's a fair example. Let's take the New Balance example I um, brought up earlier. New Balance sneakers, some that are made completely here in the United States, um, they're the same cost as a pair of Nikes or Adidas, which are made in China. So I don't think it's true with everything. I mean, there are some higher brow goods that are a lot more expensive, and um, so I can understand that. But at the same time, I think that you know, companies are realizing that making things in America is important. And so you're going to see in the next five years a wave of companies, I believe, coming back to this country or making a bigger deal that they are making things here. Because we pay these sports celebrities like LeBron James millions of dollars to, you know, be in a photo with our product. But you don't have to pay millions of dollars to put the American seal on there. You just have to employ Americans and produce it in this country. So I really think that, um, you know, back to the, the question, there are a lot of goods that are a lot more money that are made here because they require, um, you know, uh, higher end products or pieces in order to assemble it or, um, you know, more labor. But at the end of the day, um, I think there are a lot of goods that you can find that are still, um, you know, within people's budgets of where they are now. And your background? Um, you know, I, um, my family's from the southeast, um, you know, kind of a mixture of uh, service industry. And, um, you know, I went into journalism and then um, partnered up with uh, Nathan several years ago um, to form Life as My Movie Entertainment to focus on documentary film. And, you know, my connection to manufacturing is to my wife. Her family grew up in Detroit, so I heard all the stories. I got to see the ruins and see kind of what happened to, you know, her family that, you know, grew up and lived um, building cars at a factory that is no longer there or that's changed within, you know, the community that had to relocate. And if you don't mind, I'd like to add just the fact that, you know, um, as me and Vincent were looking at this topic for, as documentary filmmakers, we started looking at the food movement. So we started looking at what was going on in food. And that's the encouraging thing. We have done this before. When you look at demand, think about your grocery store, the way that people started buying food. They were thinking more about local farmers markets. They were thinking about where their food was coming from. The organic label sort of popped up out of nowhere. And now when you walk into your grocery store, there's entire sections of the store designated to organic goods. Well, that's not too much different from dad's or grandpa's made in America label. And if we start demanding more and more of that, you're definitely going to see it. You're going to see companies starting to use that as a marketing tool like Vincent was talking about. And I think that that demand is going to cycle up. The consumer starts demanding things. Companies start figuring out ways to make that happen. Walmart's already committed to buy $50 billion worth of American-made goods over the next 10 years. Apple Computer is going to be making a computer here. Motorola going to be making a phone here. These are all relatively new announcements because of demand. Then you're going to have Apple and Motorola and Walmart calling their legislators trying to figure out, hey, what's the best way that we can do this? And I think Washington gets in line 
And I think that's the way that it, it works, supply the, and demand. The film premiered last Friday. Where can people view it? Well, uh, right now they can go to the website, theamericanmademovie.com. Um, I know it'll be opening up here in D.C. as well as other countries, starting, I mean, other cities uh, starting next week. So they can find out all the listing dates and, uh, more importantly, you know, sign up for the mailing list to be notified when it is coming to their city. Peter is joining us from Ridgefield Park, New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Hi. How are you? Um, uh, I've been in manufacturing for 35 years in the uh, knitwear industry. Uh, I've seen my industry almost be completely fossilized. Uh, but I'm still manufacturing here. I, I went from apparel and went into, uh, into the home furnishing industry, making uh, textile products uh, for the better uh, home furnishing industry. The biggest challenge today is the infrastructure that we used to have here we no longer have, whether it's suppliers or contractors to make those products. It's not always about price. Uh, because the industry has just taken such a large hit, there aren't the yarn suppliers and notion suppliers to make those products. So I think that's a challenge for a lot of people that are trying to make goods here. Thanks for the call. Vincent Vittoria, you're shaking your head. No, no, I, I, I agree. And I think that um, it, it really goes back to those principles of supply and demand. There are certain things we're never going to be able to compete with. Labor, let's take it, right? There's no way that we're ever going to be able to have considerable wages or a reason why a company would be able to manufacture something you know, here as opposed to Vietnam or India or China. But manufacturing, the face of manufacturing has changed. So for instance, there might have been a factory that employed 300 people that, you know, in order to cut the labor cost out of the equation, had to go to China. Well, well, now that same product can be produced for maybe 50 workers. But those aren't the same workers. These are the workers that now have a technical um, mindset of, you know, operating machinery in which, you know, there's things that go into it that aren't just the hard labor. So I think that is encouraging to you know, not only go back to what Nathan said earlier about the skills gap, to make that something that's important to our youth, that you know, making things with your hands, building things, but it also is encouraging because there are, um, there are companies that now can kind of change the way they were manufacturing it and make it to where they can do it here, and they're not relying on the, the cheapest labor for 300 people as opposed to maybe 50 people operating the machinery. So I mean, I, as the caller mentioned, I mean, it's um, you know it's definitely harder, but um, I think just as he said, he's still making things here, and you know I think that's very admirable for him to still realize that you know at a time where you can go overseas or go other routes, that he sees the importance of supporting his community and uh, you know putting things together in this country. Nathan McGill, this is from Gary, a tweet that says, "Where did you guys get the money to make this documentary? Any government grants, or was it all private sector financed?" It is. It is uh, traditional filmmaking uh, and and in, and investment. So just private investors and and uh, no one with any connection to manufacturing or any connection to the topic whatsoever. Uh, me and Vincent have all the creative control when it comes to our company. Life is my movie entertainment, and that allows us to tell stories in a unique way. And if when you watch the film, you'll see it's it's not leaning to the left. It's not leaning towards the right. Um, it's really about the personal stories of the people in manufacturing today, the things that, um, that they uh, are dealing with. What are the struggles? What are the ups and the downs? How does demand impact that? What's our role as consumers? And so uh, the film really looks at um, those sort of, uh, those sort of heart, heart to heart topics as well as gives a base of understanding of where we've been historically and where and where we can go in the future. And Doug makes this point on our Twitter page, I would buy more Americans if I knew the label even pay more because they last longer. Shirley is joining us from Michigan, our line for Republicans. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just, uh, oh, I'm going to love this movie. I work for Westinghouse Electric. Our line for Republicans. Good morning. That's a great example of, I guess, you know... <laughs> Yeah, sure, uh, and we can hear you. You know, the problem is you have the television set on, so turn the volume down. We'll hear you much better, and okay. go ahead with your comment or question. Okay. Um, I lived in Pittsburgh, and I worked for Westinghouse Electric. I'm 78 years old, but at that time, they, at, I lived in Pittsburgh, uh, worked at Westinghouse Electric. At that time, there were 32,000 men working. They were inventing the first computer called UNIVAC. It was an entire building. 
and everyone said it would never go. My dad worked for Westinghouse Airbrake. That that town was so beautiful. Now it's all beautiful, but it's all technical. And there are lots of unemployed people. But when I see something made in America, oh, gosh, I'm thrilled to death. So you guys just work as hard as you can, and I'll sell your mu your movie for you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And, and you know, that's the, that's the story of America. This is about all of us. We are the greatest innovators, the greatest inventors, the greatest minds. We've come up with some amazing things. The best thing that America makes is Americans. And if we can go to work every single day and, and make it happen, um, uh, you know, we can, we can change this country. So as consumers, we've just forgotten about manufacturing. We remember innovation. We like to champion those things. But if we, next time we go to the store, if we can start flipping things over and start taking a look at where our goods are made, those dollars impact real Americans uh, that are working all across the country. Vincent Vittorio, uh, Shirley yes. was making that point. I just want to share with you, this is what Jim said on our Twitter page with regard to computer chips. He says the computer chips are made in Pacific Rim countries. The machines that make the chips are made in America. No, that, that's, that's an interesting situation, which there's a lot of things like that, that, you know, there's so many parts to the whole or what's assembling it. But um, I think that it's about, um, you know, these companies waking up and realizing that, um, while they'll be able to save a little bit with the labor, realizing the importance of kind of, you know, housing something here specifically in this country like those chips. But just to piggyback on the, the Shirley call, I was very moved by that. I think that's the response we've gotten from everyone that's seen the film is that you know you walk into a film about manufacturing and I think that um, you know documentary filmmaking has been somewhat um, scapegoated into this like propaganda or you know sensationalizing on things you know granted um, there's filmmakers like Michael Moore and others that have done things that are very political in nature where you know our true goal is to um, bring a topic that maybe people don't have a full understanding of or maybe they've you know been interested in but never really got the time to kind of get the research together to understand historically why things have come to be the way they have and then what are the real world examples of what they can relate to and so that's the encouraging thing is that when people respond to the film or the topic I mean how patriotic is that that she's you know stepping up and saying that this is something that she believes in and that you know historically it was a part of her life and I think many Americans would feel that way I mean you look at Tom's shoes for instance you know the idea that we are buying a pair of shoes and when we put our money towards that pair of shoes we're also helping a child in a foreign country well, you know, that's very admirable, but I think that same thing would be true if people realize I'm buying this object, this product on a Walmart shelf or anywhere for that matter, and it's employing Americans. So I'm helping my community, and I think that's very encouraging to, you know, the topic. Our guests, Nathaniel McGill and Vincent Vittorio, they are both behind the, the film called American Made Movie, which is available online at AmericanMadeMovie.com. Jim is joining us on our line for Democrats from New York State. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, when we talk about manufacturing and economy in this country, uh, I don't hear anyone talking about the issue of our currency. Um, since the Unconstitutional Act of the Federal Reserve in 1913, our dollar has plummeted 90 percent. Do you plan to expose the Federal Reserve in your new documentary? Do you address that issue? We don't, we don't really talk about currency. We don't talk about currency manipulation. It is an important issue, we feel. But like Vincent said, what we were doing with this film is really giving a base of knowledge and understanding on the topic as a whole for people who might not understand it, as well as telling the personal stories of manufacturers today in this global economy. The reason we didn't talk about that is that that topic changes on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with who the currency manipulators are, with where our currency is standing, and we want this film to have a long shelf life where we can have this being used in schools and universities, educating students, um, and it can be a, a base of knowledge for people to use for decades to come. Can you address this theme on our Twitter page, paying living wages? Raising the minimum wage will increase our ability to demand and pay for American-made goods. You know, I go back to the um, cost comparative example. I think that, um, you know, while raising minimum wage um, and, you know, living wages and are important, I think that there still are goods that are cost comparative. The New Balance example and other things, um, the same way as New Balance announcing they're going to, um, I mean, not New Balance, excuse me, Walmart announcing they're going to put all that money into specifically American-made goods, I think it'll prove 
to be true when that's the first shelf you walk into the Walmart and see that when people come out in great numbers and start purchasing things on those shelves, that all of a sudden there'll be a second and all of a sudden there'll be a third and we'll see that um, Walmart will have to call back up those companies and say, listen, you know, we want more of these. These are the things that our consumers are demanding. So I think we're going to be able to find a way that products can be manufactured for less and, um, you know, well, more money for minimum wage and living wages are important. I think that uh, there are still goods out there that we can buy. That yeah, and I'd also say that even if we had more money, would we really contribute that to American-made goods? We say that we might, but you know, you get an extra ten dollars here, an extra twenty dollars there. Is the consumer really going to show up and do that? I think until we actually start changing people's minds on this issue. Uh, we'll, we would see more of the same. So really what, where it has to change is where you are. Take responsibility now with what you've got and what you make and just try to find one more thing that's made in the U.S. And, and like Vincent said, you will be surprised because it just might be changing the kind of paper plates that you buy or the type of paper cups that you buy or, or you know, where, your, um, wh where your toilet paper comes from, for goodness sake. Uh, take a look at the labels, and, and you can find things that are made here employing Americans, and it's just, uh, it's just a matter of choice. The film runs uh, about an hour and a half. We'll take one more look in a moment at the town of Greenwood, Mississippi. But first, Carol, who is joining us from Rockaway, New Jersey. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, when uh, we exported our production and our industry, and we set into place NAFTA, CAFTA, GATT, and the WTO, we stepped aside as a, an American political body, and we allowed the political and the corporate entities to take over our economy. Everything they do with regard to these so-called free trade deals glorifies and enriches the globalists. They have destroyed our economy. They've taken the jobs, the salaries, the middle class, and they've eradicated them. Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we in the film, we, we, we give a understanding of what are the viewpoints on this issue. And so we look at the protectionist viewpoint, and we look at the free trade viewpoint. And we kind of define those for the viewer. And what our caller is talking about is a lot of the free trade views that spread across the political spectrum. So we've seen Democrats in office sign free trade agreements. We've seen Republicans sign the same free trade agreements. Um, and so it's not a, a left or a right issue. It's really a protectionist or a free trade issue. And we try to, to boil it down in the film of, of, of what are the viewpoints that are out there and then also put it back onto the consumer because at the end of the day, Washington doesn't make decisions if the American consumer that drives our economy is demanding a lot of a certain kind of good. Now, we're not ever going to be able to bring back manufacturing to the levels that it once was when we were the only, person, the only country doing it in the world. But um, where we stand today in this global economy um, that demand says, hey, we want to see these types, these types of jobs back in America again. We want to see companies coming back here to make more things. And if you do that, we're going to buy your goods. Another point of view on the issue of wages and trade. Raising minimum wages may help, but it's health care and education. Addressing the cost would be more effective. Pat from Spring Hill, Florida, Republican line. Good morning. Thanks for waiting. Good morning, and thank you for taking my call. Certainly. I was raised, uh, my dad was a tool and die setter for as long as he was working. And so I remember what it was like to work for a man who, to, to have a dad who was in the factory business. But what scares me is I am now 70 years old and I have five grandchildren and I've put aside money for their college education. And I say to myself, are there going to be jobs for college graduates? That's what really scares me, because so much is now technology. Could you thank you, Pat? Address that. Certainly. No, Pat. That, that's a, that's a great question. I think that's something you know, as Nathan mentioned earlier, about defining the purpose of education in America. I think that it's hard because we look at these four-year universities and we say, oh, well, that's great. That's what we always wanted when we were younger. It's the 
um, you know, the quintessential thing that everyone needs to do in order to have a proper understanding to get into the workforce. But I don't know if that's always true for everyone. I think that the skills gap, um, there are jobs available that we don't have a skilled workforce in order to, to have these jobs. And I think that we need to redefine as um, you know, family unit, as a community, the importance of jobs like a plumber, the importance of jobs of understanding how to um, operate machinery. And I think that technical or vocational education should not be looked at as a, a secondary to that of a four-year university because um, there might be 3,000 um, you know, people graduating with an education degree to childhood education and only 300 jobs. And to me, that is a, a real problem that needs to be addressed. And ironically enough, is the topic of our, our next motion picture, dealing with education in a way of understanding the purpose of education in America. So a yes or no question from Jody. Is it time to go to stores and ask the manager why he doesn't have things made in the USA? Sure, absolutely. Why not? If you don't see something that's, that's made in the U.S., go, go ask the manager. The manager probably has never thought about it. And, and he'll probably think about it for the first time that day. That's the, that's the amazing thing we've seen with people watching this film. One more excerpt from the film and the town of Greenwood, Mississippi. When many of the manufacturing jobs gone, Greenwood became almost like a ghost town. The same thing was happening all across the country. U.S. Steel Corporation today announced that it's permanently closing 16 plants. Jones and Laughlin Steel Plant is shutting down for good. A total of 5,000 steel workers employed at several plants here will soon lose their jobs. The devastating news of yesterday that Bethlehem Steel will close its plant next year. Some 66,000 more auto workers will be laid off next week. General Motors confirmed it today. It is going to close plants employing almost 30,000 workers. 200 American steel mills shut down all or part of their operations. 31 auto plants closed for good. The American trade deficit was supposed to be going down. It isn't. In the 1970s and 80s, other countries began to open up to trade and invested in education and infrastructure. They supplied benefits to their domestic businesses and offered incentives to foreign investors. Under a burdensome tax code and new competition, company executives began looking outside the U.S. to increase their profitability. Over the next 30 years, companies that made their products in America began to close down their manufacturing divisions and began outsourcing that work to other countries. From the documentary, American Made Movie, and our two guests here, Vincent Vittorio and Nathan McGill. Vincent Vittorio will begin, uh, will conclude with you on, on that point. W what's the message? Well, Steve, thanks so much again for having us on. I think that the message to us has been the response. It's really been people see this movie and a light bulb goes off. All of a sudden, we've gotten you know, hundreds of emails where people are like, wow, I'm, I'm glad that this is something you were able to put together. And I hope that you know, many Americans can see it because it's changed the way I look at my products and it's changed the way that I purchase things. We're not trying to be protectionists to say everything has to be 100% you know, American that you buy. But at the same time, if we all just do our little part or just look a little deeper, we can really change things in this country. So we want everybody to go to the website, theamericanmademovie.com, sign up for the mailing list, uh, get involved, get engaged, and get out to your theaters and go check out this movie. The one thing that surprised you, what was it? the amount of manufacturing that's still done in this country. As sad as it is that you know, things have gone overseas, there are still a lot of people that believe in this country that are producing things here. New Balance, I'm, I'm a big advocate. I sound like an advertisement for them. I think I've mentioned them 10 times, but they are a company that sees the importance of embracing this country to manufacturing things here. And I think other companies will come back because they're gonna see that there's, there's something you know, great about making things in this country. Vincent Vittorio and Nathan McGill, the director and producers, respectively, of American Made Movie. Gentlemen, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for having us. It's thanks, been great. Steve. Appreciate it. And, of course, we'll continue the conversation tomorrow morning on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. A reminder, live coverage of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee this afternoon. And at the White House at this hour, the president meeting with congressional leaders. We'll have much more on all of that. Your calls and comments tomorrow morning. You can check out our schedule information anytime at C-SPAN.org. Thanks for being with us on